necessarily the person sitting next to you, but. I, 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 thought had the project and I did. Uh, I did start recording, just so everyone's aware. Can't be sued. All right, recursion. To understand recursion, one must understand recursion. I'm, I'm going to keep the flowers and the bees and the cows. I'm going to erase everything else. The flowers actually had some significant meaning. <laughs> All right. Yeah, leave the cow. It's our friend. We should name our cow. Bessie? Oh, yeah. Mark. Yeah. Cow today is Mark. Today's class is brought to you by Mark the Cow. Okay, so what is recursion? Yes. So recursion. Well, that was, that was how it's implemented in Java. Let's see. What does the book tell us? <clears throat> a program technique in which you describe actions to be repeated using a method that calls itself. Okay. Using a method. That calls itself. So that was the common part of both what Brayden said and what the book says. By the way, if you don't hear something I say, go ahead and raise your hand. I'm trying to remind myself that this, well, even though this is a microphone, it's a microphone for the iPad and not for my voice. So it's, my voice isn't being amplified today. So I get to yell. OK, so recursion is using a method that calls itself. Does anyone have any other answer they're trying to grade and trying to figure out if it's right or not? What you got? Um, when code is repeated, the way that the value from the past can apply right or the same code is used again to get a new value? Okay, sorry, say that again. The guys, you gotta be quiet. So when code is repeated in such a way that the value from the past value or the same code is used again to get a new value? The key part of that is that the same code is used again, but that's, that's not quite the same as code reuse. It doesn't quite capture that we're using a method to call itself. I give half a point for that, and that's fine. Anyone else have anything else that they're wondering about for that? Okay. And of course, people joke around with this saying that in order to understand recursion, one must understand recursion. I like it best when it's written in a circle like this. Oops, I can't write backwards. Or upside down. I'll try. I didn't give myself enough room. There's someone's written like that where there's no beginning or end. Now, of course, when we do this, we're talking about infinite recursion. We're not actually talking about real for real recursion because when you use recursion in programming, if you're going to use it for something useful, you want to avoid infinite recursion. 
but we'll talk about that when we get to question four. question two what's the difference between a recursive solution and an iterative solution? Good, Chris. Okay, so it sounds like what you're saying is with an iterative solution, you just run through the method once. Whereas for recursion, you call it multiple times. That's part of it. Well, that's actually the concept. Does anyone else have a more specific way, a way to easily tell whether your solution is recursive or not? I saw a brain intense person that went down. You were just, just stretching. Okay, then I saw Julie's hand. Iteration uses a loop. Perfect. Oh, I guess I used two different shades of blue. I meant to use two different colors. Oops. An iterative, um, <clears throat> sorry, solution uses a loop. Whether it's a for loop, whether it's a while loop. If someone wrote down you know, a for loop, that's fine. Iteration uses a loop. Recursion has a method that calls itself. So if you're asked to look at a set of code and determine whether it's a recursive solution or, sorry, a recursive solution or an iterative solution, look to see if there's a loop or if there's self-call. Hey, look, look at question three. A set of code and I'm asking if it's an iterative solution or if it's a uh, recursive solution. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, for question two, it's one point if they made this distinction. Recursion is a method that calls itself. Iteration uses a loop. Does anyone have any other question or answer that they're wondering about? David? So this says uh, it has the recursive solution, but for iterative solution, it says they handle an entire task by starting from the beginning. Yeah, but technically a recursive method will do the same thing. It'll start at the beginning okay. and then we'll call itself. So I'll give half a point for that. Yep. Could you say um, if recursive gives you the same output on um, iterative gives you a different output? That's where we're kind of mixing that down. Because when you have a, an iterative solution and a recursive solution, you'll get the same output. It's two different methods, two different ways of solving the same problem. So at this point in time, we're getting into the how you solve the problem more than what the solution is at the end. That's something to keep in mind. Whenever you're writing a program and you have an iterative solution, oftentimes you'll have a recursive solution as well, but not always. But in all cases where you have a recursive solution, it is possible to also solve it using iteration instead. I personally prefer iteration, but there are some places where you can use less code in a recursive solution instead. Let's talk more in depth on uh, recursion next class, mostly because of the fact that I want you to look at the recursive assignment, I want you to think through it, but also because I want you to be able to finish up the stack assignment. And I realize I didn't really give you a coding example of using templates, I think there's still some confusion on that, I want to do a code example on that too. So I'm just going to scratch the surface on recursion today with the quiz. I'm going to show you the next assignment, and then we'll talk about it a bit more on Wednesday when we come back to, to class. And the assignment will be due on Wednesday because it's really not that long. It doesn't take a lot of code. But you do have to think through it, think about how it works. So um, in that case, I would say no. No points for that one. Okay. Um, anyone else with any questions on question two? All right, question three. We have a method called write stars. 
And we have a for loop, which displays some asterisks. And then we have system.println at the end to be nice and tidy. So is that an iterative solution or is that a recursive solution? Iterative. Iterative. Why? That's a for loop in it. If you want to know the recursive way of solving the same problem, you just look in the book. It's actually on the example that was given. Yep, there's a right stars method. There's a recursive one on page 725. That's the one where it actually gives you comments about what each part is. This then swings us into question four. So question three, there's just one point, and there's just one right answer, which is iterative. Didn't have to say why. So it was all or nothing for that one. So for number four, what are the key ingredients of a recursive solution? Sorry. I asked the question and then I turn away so I can't see uh, who's answering me. Um, it's brown. Mm. Darker green. All right. What are the key ingredients of a recursive solution? Key ingredients. Yes. Is it like base case and recursive case? Yes. It is not like base case and recursive case. It is base case. That is an A. Recursive case. So hopefully when you did your reading, you took notes of the new vocabulary words. That is always a smart thing to do. Because if you notice, Answers to the quiz are usually, or often, from those vocab terms. The blue words, as we called them in uh, Jeopardy when we did it. Okay, so what's the base case? Thank you, Chris. Yeah, simplest task is part of it. What else? Thanks, David. Yes, condition that stops recursion. All good recursion must come to an end. All right, so what's the recursive case? Is someone on this side of the room? No one on this side of the room got that one right? Wait, what? Not me. It's probably like the least part of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is where we have the method calling itself. It's a cute little loopy F there. Let's try that. Okay. So I'm going to go back and double check to see what the book says on this. In the recursive case, it says, a case within a recursive solution that involves reducing the overall problem to a simpler problem of the same kind that can be solved by a recursive call. That's confusing. I like this one better. Recursive case is the part of the method, I guess I should say, that calls itself. Part of the method that calls itself. 
So usually you're solving a certain problem. You're probably going to have an if statement. Well, you need an if statement. Let's say separate between these two classes or two cases. And then within the recursive case, you might have another if statement as well to perform a certain calculation. For instance, you can use recursion for the problem that we talked about. I thought we talked about this early in class, either that or we talked about it last year, and I don't remember. I think it was really early on when we were talking about loops. The uh, 3x plus 1 conjecture, if you remember that. You take a number and it's even, you divide it by 2. And if you take a number that's odd, then you multiply it by 3 and add 1 to it. And you keep repeating those steps over and over and you'll always end up with 1. So far, no one has proven that one right or wrong yet. But every time anyone has ever tried to do it against a real number, it always ends up with 1. You can solve that problem using recursion. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and write that up on the board because people are like, wait, what? That's kind of a cool thing. So, if the number is even, and you take the number, I guess I'll say if x is even, to make it clear, this is tangent, but I'll take it anyway. It's even divided by 2. If odd, sorry, if x is odd, multiply it by 3 and add 1. How does that get 1? Okay, somebody give me a number. 12. 12. Okay, so I have 12. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to divide it by 2, which gives me 6. Now I'm going to run through this again. What's Okay, 6 is even, right? right? I'm going to go ahead and divide it by 2. So now I'm going to end up with 3. 3 is odd. So now I'm going to take 3, I'm going to multiply it by 3, and add 1 to it, which is 10. Is 10 even or odd? It's even. 5. So yeah, so it's 16. Now we're at a power of 2, so we're going to go all the way down. 16 divided by 2 is 8. 8 divided by 2 is 4. 4 divided by 2 is 2. And 2 divided by 2 is 1. You can do that with any number. You can start with an odd number and did the same process, we do the same thing. Once again, that's never been proven true or false. It's just. 3x plus 1 conjecture is one term for it. It's one of the things we studied when we were in college just for fun. So if you're going to do this in a recursive way, excuse me, can I help you? All right, so your base case is going to be once you hit 1, you're done. You have no reason to keep looping in that case. You're going to return everything back. You're going to return that you ended up with 1. Whereas your recursive case, that's where you're going to have all of this logic to determine if x is even. And call the method again, only this time instead of passing in x, then you pass in x divided by 2 or 3 times x plus 1. But in this case, you're doing the same thing over and over again, so you might as well call the same method over and over again. There's actually a good example of something you can do simpler, or simply, with recursion. You can also do it simply using a loop, but you can also do it simply using recursion as well. Two different ways of solving the same problem. But, so, so for 4, the key ingredients, you just had to write base case and recursive case. If they didn't use the terms base case and recursive case, but they described what they were instead, then you can go ahead and give them full points for that. That question is worth two points. So one point each for the base case and for the recursive case. And if they got part of it, they gave you terms that were close but not quite right, then you give them half a point for 
each of the terms that they did that with. So you give one and a half points if, say, they nailed the recursive case, but for base case, they said something similar to base case, but it wasn't quite right. Like, maybe they put alkaline case instead. <coughs> I thought that was funny. All right. Um, <clears throat> anyone else have any other questions about that one? All right. Extra credit. What would happen if the base case for a recursive solution is missing? It goes forever because the base case is the simplest task that stops recursion. Stops recursion from happening. This is our. End of the line. Another acceptable answer is if you said stack overflow, because that's actually what would happen. Something to try if you're if you've got some time or if you just want to try it would be to go into Eclipse, create a program with just one class and two methods. One method would be your main method. I guess you just call the main method over and over again, but just for fun, just create a method called method that doesn't do anything except call itself and see what happens when you run it. After about a second or so, you'll get a crash. Windows will tell you, hey, this program misbehaved. Do you want to send a report to Microsoft? Which would be funny because we wouldn't know what to do with it because it's not an app that we're familiar with. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually did that in um, one of my classes in high school, which is kind of fun. But um, <clears throat> anyway, your program will crash because the system's going to say, wait, you're using up too much memory. Um, you're not allowed to use the, that much memory that quickly. In order to keep from bringing the whole system down, we're going to kill your program instead. And the reason is because every time you call a method, it talks about this in the book a little bit. I don't remember if it's in the reading that I gave you. It probably isn't. But if you remember the stack that we talked about last time, that's how method calls work. So every time you call a method, it keeps track of which method was called. So when you call your main method, so when, which is when you start your program, it'll go ahead and it'll push that onto a stack. It's called the call stack. When you call a method within your program, it pushes it onto the stack. When that method hits a return statement or gets to the end of the method, if it's a void method, It'll pop it off the stack. So it forms these push and pop operations, just like what we were talking about with the stack assignment. So if you call you know, method zero in your program, and then you call method one within method zero, and then maybe method one also calls method two, and it'll continue to build the stack until one of the methods returns, and it pops it off the stack. So in the example I just gave you, if you keep calling method zero or have method zero keep calling itself, it's going to keep pushing these onto the stack. And once it hits this point, where I can't actually write anything on the board anymore, when it can't write anything, or not, the system doesn't allow it to push anything else onto the stack, it's going to be a stack overflow. So if you've ever heard of the website stack overflow where you can ask about programming questions, this is where the term comes from. So that's why that actually caused a crash. But the most important thing to keep track of for, or the most important, or the, well, Stack overflow is an acceptable answer, but the answer that I was expecting is that you would have infinite recursion, recursion that goes on forever. So to understand recursion, one must understand recursion. To understand recursion, one must understand recursion. That's infinite recursion. You've got a Google. Almost like the redundancy department of redundancy. That's right, the redundancy department of redundancy. Department. So if you go to Google and you type in recursion, 
it's kind of funny. It will uh, say, did you mean recursion? <laughs> and so then when you click on the link, it sends you to the exact same page. <laughs> so once again, that's infinite recursion. Funny humor. We want to avoid infinite recursion. So let's go ahead and look at the next assignment. Runtime error. Yes, that is technically correct. Go ahead and give him a point. If you do not have another AP class, period, will you stand up? Woo! <laughs> What are you doing? Uh, I was looking for a stick Oh. But she has like all five full copies and that's big. Don't lose these because they're very limited. It's hard to come by. Is that AP classes? Wow. I'm hoping it has staples in it. All right. Go ahead and pass your quizzes in. Right, folks, the quiz was out of five because question four was two points. A few markers out of four, I'll go in and try to figure out what the actual score was. I did what? There's size of big ants? I don't remember. I've actually never used them before. But in C++, I learned how to write my own big int class, which is fun. All right, student view. And now I'm going to take this whole thing and I'm going to share it, windowed. All right, coming back to more lectures, so Folks on the front row, I can hear you. That's a bad thing. OK, so let's go ahead and look at modules. Oh, look, I've added a new module, which hopefully you found, because that's where the reading was for recursion, which is the reading on recursion, which is about recursion. The assignment here actually goes with recursion, so this should actually probably be below factorials. Or the indentation's weird. Hmm. I'll look at that and fix it. But solving 
for factorials is one of the most common examples for using recursion. And it's really simple. What you're doing is you're writing a program that calculates a factorial. Is anyone not familiar with what a factorial is? Just in case there's someone who is, who doesn't want to speak up, I'll explain. It is when you multiply um, a number by all the numbers before it, except for zero. So for instance, four factorial is four times three times two times one. Now if you have a calculator, like Windows calculator. Let me zoom in. Nope, won't let me make it bigger, sorry. This is represented with this N with an exclamation point number after it. Because when you write a factorial, you're usually writing an exclamation point after the number. So it looks like you're just shouting four when it's actually four factorial. So if I as soon as I click that number, it gives me twenty-four for four. And we can verify that that's true by doing 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Technically, because multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything, you can cheat by stopping at 2. 4 times 3 times 2. OK, so 5 factorial would be the same thing. Whoops, 5 factorial. It's 120. So 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 is 120. If you forget to stop at 2, that's fine. You can go ahead and stop at 1, but do not stop at 0, because that's a problem. Unless you have the, the factorial of 0 equal to 1, but still. You want to remember when you're calculating your factorial, you don't want to multiply by 0. I got your tickets away. All right. So you already know how to do this with an iterative way. And that's actually the uh, algorithm that I have here. But there's a reason why it's in red. There's a reason why I say don't do this. Make this oops, bigger is what I was going for. Because this is the iterative way to do it. But if you do it recursively, which is what the requirement is, you can actually use fewer lines of code. This program does not need to be object oriented. You will need multiple methods in your main class because one of your methods needs to call itself over and over again. It's generally bad style to have main keep calling itself over and over again. As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure if it lets you do that. <clears throat> Regardless, you'll need multiple methods. And in addition to having it correctly calculate the factorials, you need to not crash when valid input is entered. So that means you have to handle any of this. So if the user types in a string, or if they type in a non-integer, so 3.6 for instance. If you type in negative numbers, um, I don't expect you to handle negative factorials. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure what happens if I would try to do a factorial here on negative number. Ha, huh, it says invalid input. So you need to handle negative factorials. Um, integers that are too large to produce good output. You might think that's not so bad, except for the fact that even if starting with a number as low as 20 and taking its factorial, it gives you a really big number. Let's see, counting the digits here. So those are three. So these are the thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions. So yeah, we hit quintillion right here, like two quintillion. Um, that's much more than a, an integer can hold. Even an unsigned long is not going to be able to hold this number. So if the integer is too large to produce good output in your program, 
you need to find a way to either prevent people from entering that number or you just need to figure out how to make your program handle larger numbers. That's where the extra credit comes in. So generally speaking, the largest you'll be able to hold with a standard integer is the factorial of 12. That's as high as you'll be able to go. So if you don't handle integers that are too large, then you'll hit this thing called overflow. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means. If I go into programmer mode in this calculator, I can pretend that I'm actually using a, um, you know, an actual binary variable like you'd see in your program. So instead of making a quad word, I'm only going to make it a byte for illustrative purposes. So in this case, I'm going to say I only have eight bits that I can fit. So what's the largest number I can hold in eight bits? Yeah, it's 255. Oops. 254. Oh, it's assigned in, so I actually have less. 128. Nope. Let's try 127. Okay, so 127 is the highest number that I can hold here. Because if I do it in negatives, I can do negative 128. That's the lowest number that I can hold. Uh, how do I do that then? If I do all the bits, I think that's going to give me negative 1. All right, sorry, I'm just playing. So, <clears throat> 127 is the highest number I can hold. But what if I'm doing a factorial of, I think once I get to set 8, I'll get past that. 8 times 7 times 6. Times 5, okay, times 4, times 3, times 2. Whoa. How did I end up with a negative number as a result of my factorial? It's because once I use this high order bit, I'm switching from a positive number to a negative number, and it flips around. So, really, when you're using uh, values in binary, you're actually going in a big wheel. You start at the lowest value, and then you'll count up, and there'll be the next lowest value, and as you go on and add set more bits, then you'll end up with higher values after that. The reason why I bring this up is because there's nothing in your program that will stop and say, hey, the result of your factorial is too large. Instead, it's going to say, it's just going to give you a bad number. So if I do 13, the factorial, the true value of the factorial is this. Six billion something number. But if you were to uh, do this using a standard int, you'd probably get a negative number because the highest a standard int can hold is this number here, which is about four billion. So if I take the factorial of 13, your program lets me do it, and I get some number other than this, then you will lose points. That's why I need to be able to understand the limits of accuracy for your program as well. I need to handle it. OK, so sample output. Is there a positive integer between 0 and 12? Because that happens to be the range. Oh. And the uh, factorial of 0 is 1. It's just one of those things that's defined by math. And it doesn't really make sense, but I'm sure that there's a way to do it. There's some sort of 0, 1 identity that's defined. But just understand that when you take factorial of 0, it's 1. You can go ahead and hard code that one. OK, so. The user enters in a string, being smart lock. Says invalid input, please try again. If they enter in decimal, that's also invalid, try again. It is my program doesn't handle numbers this high for factorials. Please try again. Okay, now I actually give it something that's valid. 
then it'll give me the right answer. Okay, so hints. Once again, math help. The uh, exclamation point is the factorial operator. Just like what we have here in our calculator. In factorial. And there's a concrete example. I've given you pseudocode for an iterative algorithm. You need to figure out how to take that iterative algorithm and make it recursive. I'm not going to give the secret away, so you will need to think about it. Reread, play with recursion until you get it. We will talk about recursion more on Wednesday, but that is also when this is due. So keep that in mind. Plan out your base case and your iterative case carefully to ensure you don't have infinite recursion, because infinite recursion will lose you points. All right, extra credit. Max points possible are 10 points, but it's very difficult to get there. We don't spend a whole lot of time getting there because we have plenty more to discuss and talk about. So like I said, the biggest downside of this is if you use an int, you can only have 13 different values, which is 0 through 12. Um, if you're going to handle more, you get extra credit. If you can expand your range to get up to 20, then you'll get two points. So it's actually very easy to do. For expansion level two, it's an arbitrary range, which means you can enter in any number and it will give you the full length. I don't even know how large this number is. All I know is that it's absolutely gigantic. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure that the Microsoft calculator can handle it. No, it doesn't. It actually puts it in scientific notation. Yep, 381 digits, which is actually what's shown here. Now, it's, it's cut off over here. I actually don't know how far off into the ether it goes. Well, this might even be cut off. Anyway, if you show all 300 and some odd digits, then you're set. Um, the catch for this one is that you must implement it on your own, so you can't use the built-in big int. Eli? Sorry. Um, <clears throat> in this case, your implementation probably would be object-oriented, and it would be good practice, but it does represent a lot of work. So especially for this assignment, you're going to want to shoot for hitting the main requirements first. Then, if you have extra time, go for expansion level one. This one's really easy. Only do this one if you're looking for a challenge. Now, if you're one of the people who's generally bored in this class because you already know all of this stuff, or it just comes really, really easy to you, this would be something that you might want to try. But only if you don't have any other classes that are taking up your time. I strongly recommend not spending more than a couple hours trying to figure this one out. All right. So the rubric, big thing is that you're using a recursive algorithm. Once again, this is one of those assignments where how you get the answer is more important than getting the right answer. All right. Anyone have any questions? I'll get up so I don't feel like I'm screaming across the room. Anyone have any questions? None? All right. So like I said, this will be due on Wednesday, which is the same day that we return from class. But today, your stack assignment is due. I just want to show you how interfaces are supposed to work. I'm going to go ahead and pull up Eclipse. Um, I'm going to go with Neon today. While it's loading up, I'm going to go back. Some people ask me, wait. The uh, interface. It's right here. Basic stack.java. It's the last thing in the resources. Go ahead and click on that. I wish it would give me a preview. I don't know why it doesn't.
Yep. So I've already downloaded basic stack like two or three times. It's kind of annoying. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to save it to the desktop. It's easy to find stuff there. I'm going to go to Eclipse. create a new project called fun with an interface. I'm going to call it finish. I'm going to go ahead and create a new class. I'm going to call it main class. And yes, I do want a main method in it. Then I'm going to go and create a new class. And this is, I'm going to call my stack. And then I'm going to create an interface <coughs> that I'm going to call basic stack. And then I'm going to take the basic stack file that I saved to my desktop. Maybe. Hey, I have a microphone. Okay, let's see where it went. So I'm going to save something to the desktop and I still can't find it. It's fine, it's your desktop. If it were mine, I would do things differently. Stop trying to open this in Internet Explorer. I don't want to open Internet Explorer. I want to open. I did it with Notepad plus plus will work. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and do a Control A and a Control C to copy the whole thing. I'm going to go back to Eclipse. I'm going to go to this basic stack, and I'm going to go ahead and paste it in. All right, so now I have this interface here, but I'm not doing anything with it until I say, hey, I want to actually implement it. Implements basic stack. Cool. And as soon as I do that, I get an error. Why do I get an error? Because it's only me have to implement all the methods. My program will not compile now because I said I'm going to implement basic stack. Basic stack has four methods I need to implement. So I'll go back to my stack, plead to the methods there. For today's demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and give them empty body because I don't want to do this assignment for you. Now I'm getting errors because of the fact that it says, wait, you need to return things. Mm. What happens if I do this? Cool, let's get away with that. This object is now a string, because that calls the uh, string constructor. OK, so now I'm returning an object there. has no problem with that. There's a Boolean. 
So it has to be returned true or false. You can say return true. It has to be an int, so I'm going to return zero. Okay, now I have no errors at all. But just because of the fact that I implemented everything here in basic stack doesn't mean this is usable. Of course, I need to actually write things in each method that actually push, pop, give me real value for is empty and then a real value for size. So the big thing I want to show you is I can also create other methods if I want. Like constructor. Assembly. Ah, didn't realize that assembly today. Okay, if you have trouble getting this assignment done today, I might get a good score on let me know. If you happen to not get this done today, if you have a hard time because I thought you were going to have 20 more minutes in class than you did, let me know. I'll give you a little bit more time to get it done. Probably going to want to get it done by Tuesday still because we've had several class periods where we've talked about this. Have a good day. Enjoy your assembly. Hey guys.